And I'm Sarah. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the transcript. transcript. This week, the transcript investigates if artificial intelligence is taking over the world, sits down with the boys and girls tennis team, and talks to Rabbi Justin David about his synagogue's work to aid undocumented immigrants. On Tuesday, 17 states and Washington, D.C. sued the Trump administration over the decision to end fuel efficiency standards established by the Obama administration. The lawsuit is directed at the Environmental Protection Agency and its director, Scott Pruitt. The policy would have required automakers to produce vehicles which would get 36 miles per gallon by 2025. The lawsuit claims that the EPA acted arbitrarily and capriciously when rolling back the standards. On Thursday, former Massachusetts Senate President Stan Rosenberg announced his resignation from his Senate seat. Rosenberg serves as the state senator for the Western Massachusetts District, including the towns of Amherst and Northampton. This comes after the Senate Committee on Ethics determined that Rosenberg failed to meet his leadership responsibilities by allowing his estranged husband unrestricted access to the Senate and his email. Rosenberg's husband was recently charged with indecent assault and battery, among other charges. This leaves the city of Northampton with no representatives in the Massachusetts State House until the end of this term later this year. In a historic summit last weekend between North and South Korean leaders, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un pledged to denuclearize his nation as long as the U.S. does not invade. The leaders declared a formal end to the Korean War, which began in 1950. South Korea also reported that North Korea pledged to shut down their nuclear test site in May. Howdy, I'm Mikey Diaz. This week, nominations for the 2018 Tony Awards were released. The musical adaptation of Mean Girls and SpongeBob SquarePants lead the pack with 12 nods each. Nice! In other news... Artificial intelligence is taking over society as we know it. It's in our phones, computers, cars, and even in our speakers and televisions. Artificial intelligence, or AI, is exerting itself into modern society in a way it has never before. I just decided to meet with NHS's own technology expert, Jonah Niels Murphy, to learn more. So the modern definition of artificial intelligence is a programmed neural net, or programmed series of relations between different things to recognize that can then be used to pick out specific traits. In today's world, I see AI being used everywhere. If you use Google, if you use Siri, if you use Google Assistant, if you look at weather patterns that have been analyzed by a computer, chances are there's an AI looking at it and trying to figure out what's happening next. But what will AI look like in the future? I connected with Joseph O'Rourke, professor at Smith College, to learn more about AI and its role in modern society. Well, it's, uh, it is everywhere, and some of it is, is for the good. Um, marketing, it's being used, but it's also being used by the military quite a bit, and uh, there's some scary possibilities out there. Uh, a lot of the funding in robotics is, is from the military. One set of beliefs is that there will be some point at which uh, it's sometimes called the singularity, where the computers get so intelligent that they can just take off and start improving themselves. There are other people who believe this will never happen, uh, no matter how long. And then the third group is more like this may happen in, say, 100 to 500 years. I think there just has to be a general recognition that some things are inappropriate and, and the governments of the world have to pay attention to it. For example, with self-driving cars, I think it's, it's almost ridiculous that We've just let this go to the point where someone is killed without there being uh, any significant controls or leaving it up to each individual state. Artificial intelligence is becoming smarter and smarter every year, but does it resemble the same level of intelligence as a human? I met with Alexa to learn more about her. Alexa, who are you? I'm Alexa and I'm designed around your voice. Alexa, what do you do? There is a lot I can help you with. You can ask me things like, what's on TV tonight? Order a pizza, or give me an Easter egg. Hey Alexa, rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Okay, let's play. Three, two, one, paper. Thanks for watching. I'm Mikey Diaz, and I'll see you next week on In Other News. Hi, I'm Alexa.
The tiny but mighty tennis teams here at Northampton have respectfully brought in many successful awards and represented the spirit of the Blue Devil over the past few decades. Both the girls and boys tennis team are having a successful year and are hoping to bring in some team and individual achievements this season. To become more familiar with the mental game of tennis, the cheering restrictions, and the bond between teammates, I sat down with girls team member Haley Wojnar. Well, since it's more of an individual sport to bond, it's more off the courts. Like just the other night, um, two of us, three of us went out to eat Friday. And it's like on the bus ride we talk and we're not supposed to talk on the courts, but like we talk and we um, make jokes on the court when we're not playing during practice. Cheering actually is like kind of hard at tennis. It takes your like, focus away. So I do better when no one's watching me and I know a lot of the other players do better when we're not paying attention to them. There's so many different tactics and like skills you have to think about when you're hitting, like where it's going to go, how you're going to swing and stuff like that. And once you start thinking, that's when you mess up. The boys tennis team is also doing well this season, currently riding in second place in their division with a 6-2 and two record. To learn about his mental preparation and experience being on the tennis team, I talked with boys player Galen Windsor. Overall, it's been good. You know, I've kind of had a pretty just kind of steady upward trajectory through the rankings. You know, I started out as an exhibition player, not in the top seven, kind of moved my way up into sometimes playing doubles, then kind of steadily playing doubles and playing singles last year. Since we got uh, a freshman, a really good freshman this year, I kind of got bumped down to doubles again, but that's been fine by me because uh, the team's really good. So I would say having my dad as a coach this year has actually been pretty much purely positive. I thought it would be kind of weird and I was expecting it to be uh, a bit rough, but I think we work well together. It's been really good. I think he's done really well as coach um, and he's definitely one of the main reasons for our success. I think a lot of uh, being successful in, in, in the mental aspect of tennis is kind of self-talk and like regulating how you're talking to yourself. So if you're down a couple games, am I getting mad at myself? Am I you know, having a lot, a lot of negative self-talk? Because that doesn't help at all. If I'm up a few games, am I getting too cocky? You know, am, I, am I having too much positive self-talk? Kind of trying to regulate that. You can watch the girls' tennis team play home today at 4 p.m. at JFK. Softball also has a home game today at 4 p.m. against West Springfield. And boys lacrosse has a stadium game tonight at 7 o'clock under the lights against Amherst. Baseball is away at 4 p.m. today against Central. Tomorrow, girls lacrosse has a home game at 2 p.m. against Tantasqua and Boys Ultimate has a tournament starting at 9 a.m. Both the girls and boys track team has an invitational meet at 5.30. Thanks for watching Hamped Up. I'm Lulu Kesson. Hi, I'm Ashley Ginsberg, and today we're going to Congregation B'nai Israel in Northampton, a place where religion intersects with social justice. CBI has long played a role in community activism with Abundance Farm feeding many food insecure people in surrounding towns. But the temple's most recent community work has centered around immigrants living in Northampton. Rabbi Justin David, CBI's religious leader, was arrested in early 2017 in a protest of President Donald Trump's travel ban, a feat that won him the Rabbinic Human Rights Hero Award in the organization Trua. He also held a rally this winter to support DACA recipients alongside other religious leaders. But recently, Rabbi Justin David has done significant work to aid undocumented immigrants in Northampton. The temple helps undocumented immigrants as part of a surrounding system of sanctuary organizations and what they see as a moral obligation to help those in the community. I sat down with Rabbi Justin David to discuss all of this and how religion and social justice collide. How do you feel community activism and Judaism intersect? Well, they're, they go hand in hand. You know, um, uh, Jews have always been organized as communities. So if, if activism is defined as the power to make change and the actions needed to make change. The most forceful way that happens is in communities. Are there specific ways that Congregation B'nai Israel helps undocumented immigrants? So you need a sanctuary network and it's very hard for an individual house of worship to take all of this on its own without other help. Basically, if any of the local congregations um, houses someone in sanctuary, we are committed to helping that congregation and that guest. The Unitarian Universalist Society, which has a fantastic space for someone in sanctuary, uh, invited someone in. We're encouraging our membership to um, get trained for what's called accompaniment, which basically means staying at the Unitarian Universalist Society, and if ICE comes, being trained to interact with them to protect the person in shelter. Tell me about Abundance Farm. Sure, sure. So Abundance Farm, 
was um, the vision of my colleague and friend, uh, Jacob Fine, who's Rabbi Jacob Fine. So we grow food. We grow a lot of food, actually. And uh, we give that food to the survival center. The front part of the farm, you might notice, are fruit trees. And the concept from the beginning was that anyone can come and pick fruit from those fruit trees. So some of those trees are actually bearing fruit. Um, and so the idea is that really belongs to the community. Do you think mm -hmm. that Jewish people have an uh, obligation to step up when they see injustice yeah. that's very reminiscent of um, historical events of Jewish communities? So I don't think it's that historical, ob historical experience that obligates us any more than other people, but it does make this kind of perennial moral obligation more familiar to us and maybe you know, more present at the front of our minds. The Islamophobia that has been not only endorsed but actively promoted by our president um, is something that I and, and many Jewish people see as really dangerous and we feel urgency to stand up for Muslims who are being put in this situation. So this month you will receive the Rabbinic Human Rights Hero Award. Mm -hmm. right. um, can you tell me about that? Sure, sure. So, um, so first of all, I must say I'm not embarrassed, but, but deeply humbled by this award. There are about three or four others of us who are getting this award too, and uh, it's a great honor. But really, the, the greatest thing about it was, um, the greatest thing about it is that there's always a question in community when you take a stand on a controversial issue. Is it still an appropriate thing to do as a rabbi to take a step out on this issue? And this award is basically 2,000 Jewish leaders saying, Yes. Thank you so much for sitting down with me. Pleasure. My pleasure. A big thank you to Rabbi Justin David for his time this week. I'm Ashley Ginsberg, and tune in next week to meet another human of Northampton. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to buy our yearbook by May 10. You can go to treering.com to order, and feel free to talk to Anna Conley or Jamie Wan if you have any questions. <laughs>